ses ses ses
special talk. My name is Shehrubana Turan. I'm an arts and culture assistant here and uh, very thrilled and honored to have uh, each and every one of you uh, here with us tonight. Um, as a cultural diplomacy institute, uh, we are literally uh, serving uh, for our purpose of uh, establishment today with this special talk, joined by a former diplomat and ambassador, uh, Sir Terence Clark, who has extensively served in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And uh, today he will talk about the evolution of the Saluki or Tazu as an enduring part of the cultural heritage of the Middle East. Um, before we get started, uh, for those who are here for the first time, I would like to give a brief information about our institute. Um, as I mentioned, as a cultural diplomacy institute, uh, UNICEF Emory Institute was established as a foundation in 2007 with operations beginning in 2009. The aim we have here is to increase awareness of Turkish culture, support the, support the learning of the Turkish language, and stimulate greater exchange in the fields of arts, culture, science, and education. Named after the famous 13th century poet, Yunus Emre, there are a total of 66 branches across 54 countries. With this one housing an extensive library open to students and academics, and we will we welcome you all to visit us during the day, um, Monday to Friday, 10 to 6. We are all welcome to uh, have a Turkish coffee and tea with us and enjoy uh, our uh, rich, uh, small but rich uh, library collection. Um, as Yunus Emre Institute, we regularly hold an array of classes and events to teach and promote traditional and contemporary Turkish art and culture. Since opening our doors in 2010, we have become an important center in cultural exchange and the improvement of the bonds and friendship between Turkey and the United King Kingdom. And if you are active on social media, I highly recommend that you give us a follow on social media in all platform on all platforms. You can find us as at YEE Londra. I'm sure it's uh, on the screen somewhere, it will be on the screen, <laughs> on the poster, hopefully. And if you are interested, uh, we, as, as I mentioned, we, we run a, an array of uh, courses. They include Oud and Ney, uh, Tesip, the art of illumination, the Husnihat, the calligraphy, and Ebro, the paper marbling. And we have recently uh, launched a very special exhibition, the Nobel exhibition. If, have, if you haven't stopped by yet, uh, you're welcome to uh, take the tour uh, of this uh, special uh, exhibition to take a closer look at the um, artworks. And uh, before uh, further ado, I would like to welcome Sir uh, Terence Clark for his uh, inspiring talk. I was quite fascinating, fascinated um, as we were preparing uh, for this uh, special talk. I learned a lot and I'm excited to sit among you and uh, learn further from him. Thank you for that kind introduction and good evening and welcome to the audience in the hall and I gather we're online to places all around the world. Um, the, this evening I propose to deal with a part of Middle Eastern cultural heritage that uniquely links uh, the prehistoric past with the present day in an unbroken continuum, namely a hunting hound uh, called the Saluki in the West. Um, it goes under different names in different parts of the world where it also originates. Uh, for example, in Turkey, it is called Taza. In uh, Persian speaking countries, it is called Tazi, uh, which 
is believed to derive for the, from the word for Arabian. However, for this evening, I shall uh, stick to uh, the word Saluki. Now, I suspect that uh, some, perhaps many of you, have never seen the Saluki in its uh, native uh, habitat. This is probably because um, they tend to be guarded very carefully uh, away from covetous eyes or indeed thieving hands as they are regarded as a very precious possession. Even if you are lucky enough to see one, it may look quite different uh, from the popular image of the Saluki in the West with its tall, elegant frame, uh, more often than not with long hair on ears and tail, called feathering, whereas uh, the native Saluki tends to carry much less feathering or is completely smooth, that is short-haired and of smaller stature, often with uh, cropped ears. Ooh, what happened? Ah, there we are. Often with uh, cropped ears and henna stained feet, which they believe prevent damage when it is hunting. Well, this is a working hound that has been used for millennia, principally for coursing gazelle and hare over open terrain. So what is it that makes a mere dog so special, particularly in the Middle East context where dogs in general are shunned? History shows that the Saluki is no ordinary dog. This is not a recent distinction uh, from other dogs for it has enjoyed an exceptional position in Middle Eastern societies for millennia. And not for nothing was it sometimes called the companion of kings because it was so often portrayed in the company of rulers across the region, whether with an Egyptian pharaoh or an Ottoman sultan. But its history goes back much further into the cradle of civilization in Mesopotamia. It was here that the early hunter gatherers became settled farmers and here that we find some of the earliest evidence of the emergence of a hunting hound that resembled the breed we know today as the Saluki. However, I must mention here in parenthesis, the discovery in 2012 of a stone figure, figurine, claimed as that of a Saluki at Al Magar in Nejd, Saudi Arabia, among some 300 artifacts found at this Neolithic site. It was shown at an exhibition. Uh, entitled The Horse from Arabia to Ascot at the British Museum in 2015, along with two other remarkable figurines of a horse in harness and a falcon, all dated to the seventh millennium BC. Now research continues into the validity of these claims, but if confirmed, and personally, I'm not too sure about them, it would put the history of the domestication of the Saluki, not to mention the domestication of the horse and the falcon, in a totally new perspective. But back to what we do know. Like all breeds of dog, the Saluki derives from the wolf probably the smaller Arabian wolf than the larger European gray wolf. 
the process of its domestication and the development of a distinct breed of hunting hound took many thousands of years. Whereas most of the breeds you see exhibited every year at Crufts have been developed only in the last 150 years or so, it is clear from uh, this skull excavated in the 1930s from the debris in a well in the great archeological mound of Tepe Gaura near Mosul in Iraq, that by the pre-Sumerian period, about 4,400 to 3,800 BC, a Saluki type dog was already established possibly because the great open plains that around Tepe Gaura were as ideally suited then for coursing as they are today, as I was shown uh, when I visited there. From Eridu in southern Iraq, reputed to be the oldest city of ancient Sumer, a skeleton described by the British archaeologist Seton Lloyd as probably of a Saluki type dog was excavated from a grave of a young boy in a cemetery dating to early in the fourth millennium. British professors David and Joan Oates excavated at uh, Tel Brak in northeast Syria the complete skeleton of a dog dating from 2500 BC, which an expert at the British Natural History Museum described as certainly of greyhound build. In fact, a comparison of the bones with those of the first Saluki to be imported uh, into the UK from Egypt in 1895 whose skeleton has been preserved at the Natural History Museum, revealed striking similarities. The admittedly controversial British archaeologist uh, James Mellart claimed to have discovered the earliest representation of a Saluki in a faded wall painting from the Halaf period of about 5,000 800 BC at Chatal Hayuk uh, near Konya in south central Turkey. However, rather clearer are images from seal impressions in sun dried clay from the Chalcolithic period of about 5000 BC, which were described by the British excavators. Sir Max Mallowan, probably better known as the husband of Agatha Christie, and J. Cruikshank Rose at Tel Arpachia near Mosul as of some kind of coursing dog, perhaps a greyhound. About 300 similar seals and seal impressions were discovered at Tepe Gaura showing many hounds in hunting scenes, and the excavators commented, the animals depicted are rarely of any domesticated variety, except for the commonly represented Saluki. Similar seals and seasonal impressions have been found at other sites in the area. A small copper figurine excavated by Seton Lloyd at Tel Akrab, east of uh, Baghdad, dating from the Sumerian period of about 3,600 BC, clearly shows a Saluki with lop ears. From a fourth millennium cemetery at uh, Susa in Khuzistan in Iran, come painted pottery pieces described by the excavators as showing 
the oldest representations of the Salupi type of hunting hound. In a study of the Sousa pottery, the American archaeologists, Frank Cole and Chera Wiley, posited that as by this time people had long since lost the need for, uh, to hunt purely for subsistence, and since agriculture and animal husbandry were both well developed, the frequent portrayal of Salukis in art forms may suggest that, apart from their use in hunting, they may have been well uh, important for prestige purposes, such as for gifts, dowries, uh, bribes, tribute, and sacrifice. In short, well-bred hunting dogs could have facilitated and participated in many different types of social interaction, much as they still do today. For example, I heard stories in Syria illustrating the extraordinary value of the Saluki, whereby one hunter uh, was ready to exchange an irrigation pump and a horse for a single hound, while another even offered his daughter for one. And it was common to gift puppies to high placed officials or sheikhs to curry favor uh, with them. In ancient Egypt too, the walls of tombs as well as artifacts from the third millennium onwards are often decorated with both smooth and feathered salukis, some of which are even named. Sometimes these hounds are shown being delivered as tribute from the land of Punt, a mythical country to the south of Egypt, possibly extending into Saudi Arabia or South Arabia, which might suggest that the Saluki was in fact an import into Egypt. However that might be, it is only from the Egyptians that we have examples of mummified uh, dogs to give us more tangible evidence of how the early Saluki might have looked. In the Levant and on Cyprus, art artifacts showing Salukis from the second millennium have been found. The ancient Greeks certainly used fast coursing hounds for hunting, and Arian, the chronicler of Alexander the Great, certainly uh, uh, in the fourth century AD, uh, gives a fine description of them that would fit a Saluki. Moreover, it is possible that it is to Seleucus, uh, the first Naikato, one of Alexander's generals, and indeed his eventual successor, who found, founded the Seleucid Empire in 303 BC, which at one time stretched over much of the Middle East with its first capital at Seleucia uh, on the Tigris, uh, just south of Baghdad today in Mesopotamia, and that we owe the very word Saluki for Saluqiya, translated through Aramaic into Arabic, became Saluqiya, from which derives the Arabic word Saluqi. I was often amused to see Seleucid objects in the Mosul Museum labeled in English as Greyhound Dynasty. The Romans too were equally fond of hunting with Seleucids and represented them often in their mosaics all over the Middle East and North Africa. The Seleuci, sorry, uh, Oh, too far. <clears throat> the 
Saluki record is then carried on by the pre-Islamic poets of the Arabian Peninsula. Poetry has always been an important part of Arab culture. Indeed, the very word for poet, sha'ir, was held to be a person with supernatural knowledge, a wizard in league with spirits and enjoying magical powers. At that time, poetry was in the form of the qasida, poems with strict rules of composition that were meant to be recited aloud. Some of the best of these have survived in a collection known in English as the Seven Golden Odes of Pagan Arabia, known also as the Mu'allakat. Legend has it that in the sixth century, in the period known as the Jahiliya, or ignorance, uh, before the coming of Islam, there was an annual fair at Ukaz uh, uh, near Mecca, where poets met in rivalry and recited their best compositions, the most successful of which were written down, some sources say, on fine Egyptian linen in letters of gold and affixed to the door of the Kaaba in Mecca. Mu'allakat, as the poems were sometimes called, is indeed a transliteration of the Arabic word for suspended or, or hung. This is a colorful story, but it is generally dismissed by both Arab and Western commentators as improbable, not least because there is no reference to such an event uh, in the Quran, in ancient histories uh, of Mecca. Whatever the explanation, the seven odes in the collection represent some of the finest descriptions of Bedouin life of the period, particularly the natural wonders of the desert, such as in Labid ibn Rabi'a's rhapsody on a female oryx, likened to a pearl shining white in the night, which first loses her calf to wolves while sleeping among the sand dunes through a night of incessant rain. And then, as she searches desperately for it, she is pursued by hunters who let loose after her their two lop-eared hounds, which, when they catch up with her, she dispatches uh, one after the other with her spear-like horns. In this ode, hunters' hounds are merely described as lop-eared, as it may be, and it may be open to question, therefore, whether they were necessarily Salukis, but it was a common stylistic device of poets of the time to use metonymy, the omission of the noun and the substitution of a characteristic adjective or descriptive phrase. And lop-eared was identified with Salukis. Moreover, as such hounds were the great favorite of hunters among the poets and the only breed known to have been used by the Bedouin for hunting in the desert, it might have been seen as superfluous to cite repeatedly the breed by name. Another poet of roughly the same period in the late sixth century, uh, Muzarrid ibn Dirara Gubiani, leaves no doubt, however, about the breed when in a long qasida, he refers quite specifically to Banat Salukiyain, the daughters of two Salukis. The classic saga-like Qasida remained popular over the following centuries, but by the establishment of the Umayyad dynasty as caliphs ruling from Damascus in 661-750, a new specific genre of hunting poetry, or tardia, as it was called, began to appear. Though it only reached its full flowering under the Abbasid caliphs 
ruling from Baghdad uh, in 749 to 1258, especially from the prolific pen of Hassan bin Hani, known as Abu Nuwas, who died in 814. His poetry <coughs> ranged widely, and he was particularly known for his inspired verses on love and wine. However, the hunting hound clearly held pride of place as half of his 55 poems of the chase describe hunting with hounds. As with the pre-Islamic Qasida, in none of his hunting poems does Abu Nuwar simply uh, employ the word Saluki as such, but he comes closest in a fine poem which reflects the traditional view of Arab geographers and lexicographers that the Saluki came originally from a place called Saluk near Taiz in modern Yemen, rather than the Saluk uh, empire, even though the, the town of Saluk in, was set in a mountainous area of Yemen unsuited to the Saluki. Abu Nuwas wrote, I will sing the praises of a hound who cannot be outstripped of perfect conformation. He courses over all types of terrain. He was brought by kings from Saluk as if on a long flexible leash. In the chaos of the collapse of the Byzantine and Persian empires in the seventh and eighth centuries, when the Arabs burst out of the Arabian Peninsula to conquer the surrounding region and eventually wider from North Africa to China, it is clear the conquerors took their Salukis with them. Descriptions of them appear in the literature that has survived across the region, notably in Al Hayawan on animals the encyclopedic work of the great 9th century Abbasid historian, Al-Jahiz. Uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, similar coats uh, are still worn today, as you see here in Turkey. The Saluki also appeared, oops, in uh, other medieval uh, manuscripts here illustrating star formations. The Saluki also appeared more graphically and increasingly in art forms. For example, the vault over the entrance to the Umayyad uh, hunting uh, palace at Qusayr Amra east of Amman in Jordan, which is attributed to Walid, son of the Caliph Yazid, from about uh, 723 AD, is covered with a vast mural of a pack of uh, Salukis chasing onaga or wild ass, into a circle of nets in which the reputed figure of the caliph himself is showing spearing them, despite the Islamic prohibition on the representation of the living form. And I'd add this prohibition is even more graphically ignored in the adjacent bathhouse. astonishing for the 8th century under Islam. It is noteworthy that the use of hounds to drive game into killing zones is of much earlier origin, as is attested by this uh, petroglyph from Tel Hani in Syria, dated to somewhere between the 5th century BC and 4th century AD. So it is clear that despite the injunction on Muslims not to 
handle dogs, which are generally regarded as nagis or unclean, unless ritually cleansing themselves afterwards, right from the start of Islam, an exception was made for the Saluki. Grounds for this may be found in the Quran and in the Hadith, the sayings attributed to the Prophet. Thus, in Surah 5, Al-Ma'idah, the table, Muslims are specifically allowed to eat the meat of prey caught by, I quote, trained hounds, which has obviously not been uh, ritually slaughtered by having the throat cut. In the Hadith, this permission is qualified by the proviso that the Basmallah, uh, Bismillah Rahman, has been said before the hounds are slipped, released for the chase. At the time of the Prophet in the Hijaz, the only trained hounds used for hunting eat as such prey were Salukis. There was a brief time when the Prophet issued an order that all dogs should be slaughtered to prevent rabies, especially black dogs with orange pips over their eyes, a common coloration uh, in Salukis. But the order was soon modified to exclude useful hunting, herding, and guarding dogs. So the Saluki continued to enjoy its privileged position. And as unto today, it was allowed inside the Bedouin tent and its companionship was enjoyed without uh, inhibition. As Abu Nawaz wrote, I will sing the praises of a hound whose owner's good fortune is assured by his tremendous efforts, all the good things they have come from him, all the assistance they have comes from him. His master is always like a slave to him. At night, he brings him nearest to his bed. If he is uncovered, his master puts on him his own coat. He has a blaze and his legs are white. His excellent conformation is pleasing to the eye, also the receding corners of his mouth and his long muzzle. Gazelles are really in trouble when he is hunting. He relishes his hard running attacks on them, hunting them down, 20 of them in his headlong course. What a fine hound you are without equal. Despite the devastation wreaked upon the Abbasid Empire by the Mongols in the 13th century, the Saluki survived and frequently appears in art forms from Persia, uh, Ottoman Turkey, and Mughal India. And it had already been long established in China thus maintaining its special status as the hunting companion of the nobility. It seems also to have been carried to Europe, possibly initially by returning crusaders. And it often appears, appears in major works of art, particularly from some of the great Italian masters, such as uh, Veronese. Even Queen Victoria had one from Turkey, which was painted by Lancia. Traditions die hard, but right across the region in the last 70 years or so, major upheavals such as revolution, wars, migrations, and the settlement of the nomads have profoundly affected the old way of life. And the Saluki has not come through unscathed. Even as recently as the 1980s, when I first became involved with Salukis in Iraq, they were still regarded as a treasure 
to be strictly protected and given, never sold, only to assured owners. The huge increases in oil wells of the Gulf states has changed all that and opened up a market for Salukis, which Turkish breeders are very happy to supply. Fresh impetus to the commercialization of the breed came about roughly 30, 20 years ago um, from the development of a new form of sport in the Gulf, Saluki racing. It had been tried first in the mid 1990s in Al Ain in Abu Dhabi, but it was not a success on an oval greyhound type of racetrack. However, they then tried a different, more natural approach by adapting a straight section of a couple of kilometers of a camel race course. At the start, a live blindfolded gazelle suspend, uh, is presented to the hounds to fire up their enthusiasm. It is then discreetly replaced uh, with a stuffed gazelle suspended on a boom mounted on a pickup. The vehicle is then driven parallel with the course and the hounds pursue the stuffed creature over distances of up to two and a half kilometers. The events are attended by crowds of mainly young people and the winning owners often uh, receive handsome rewards like uh, top of the range Range Rover. As a consequence, some of the young sheikhs now maintain huge establishments. Oops, oh, too far. Huge establishments uh, to be compared with the hunting kennels, uh, kennels of the Abbasid uh, rulers. Some purists in the West decry this new sport as they believe it will lead to a demand for a sprinter rather than an all round hunting hound. But such views ignore the fact that in its traditional role, the Saluki has always pursued the gazelle more or less in a straight line, very much as on the straight track. Certainly the sport has revived great interest in this aspect of the Arabs' cultural heritage, and it, is, and it often forms a part of the festivals that some of the Gulf rulers support in order to keep their history and traditions alive in the public memory. Though sometimes with uh, a modern touch of camel bling. Moreover, changing attitudes internationally towards the preservation of wildlife have led to the introduction of hunting bans or restrictions in many of the Saluki's countries of origin. This has given rise to fears that the Saluki will lose some of its innate hunting characteristics. However, the hunting bans are often circumvented, not least by those who can afford to take their hands with them on hunting expeditions to those countries where hunting is still allowed. Or the hounds are muzzled and allowed to chase but not catch a gazelle in a simulated hunt. In Turkey, where hunting with hounds is still allowed, the breed has been popularized in recent years by the demand I mentioned for uh, strong uh, coursing hounds uh, from the Gulf states. And Turkey is seeking recognition for the Talzer as 
a purely Turkish breed under the name of Sultan Anadolu Tadisi. So one way or another, the Saluki or Taza is still being bred with the ability to perform its traditional role. However, its situation today is in a state of constant evolution and change. And it has to adapt to new circumstances, such as being accompanied to the hunt with their owners mounted on motorbikes, or being conveyed there in the back of a pickup. I even spotted a Saluki supermarket in Al Ain. Thus, the special qualities that have seen it through the vicissitudes of millennia seem likely to continue to ensure its survival into the future. And on that note, let me end where I began in Mesopotamia, where on my last visit to northern Iraq, I was delighted to see the younger generation being introduced to hunting with Salukis in the traditional manner. And let us not forget, the Saluki is also still being celebrated in art, in calligraphy, or even on the cover of my book. Thank you. Um, can we have uh, your questions, if you have any questions from the audience? Hmm. Sorry? Speed. Speed. About 35 miles an hour. And they can keep it up over a couple of kilometers, uh, which distinguishes them from the Greyhound. And the Greyhound is a sprinter. And after about 800, 900 meters, it literally dies. Quite different. Yes. How do they kill as well? Do they talk to the panthers or like talk to the they bite the neck? Very often they catch it by a leg and so it trips up. And, and they will hold it down for their uh, master to come up and kill it ritually. Sometimes they will um, bounce on the neck and bring it down to the ground, but, but hold it there. They don't actually kill it uh, so that it can be ritually sorted. Whereas a hair being much smaller, they will kill it on the spot. Were they traditionally or even currently hunted um, one by one or in pairs or packs? Or mm. How much variation was there in sort of tactics? Um, it varies. Uh, some of these large hunting establishments, large kennels, will take out a pack of half a dozen Salukis. Uh, and it then depends how sporting they are. Um, usually they will slip release only two at a time. But I have seen uh, hunting parties who get carried away in the excitement and release all the dogs at once, which is not terribly sporting. Whereas the Simple farmer, peasant, uh, will often go out with just one and uh, bring home something for supper. Do they, work well? they work very well as a pair. Uh, very often you find a, a well-trained uh, hound will show a younger one the way. I've actually seen when they've been hunting foxes in the desert, um, 
an experienced hound will show the other ones how to take a, a fox, because a fox, unlike a gazelle, will bite back. And yes, uh, in this country, we call them um, gaze hounds. Uh, in fact, the, the proper name of the Saluki club in this country is the Saluki or uh, Gazelle Hound Club. And its um, characteristic is that it hunts by sight, not uh, scent. But on the other hand, if you take one out, it will be scenting all the time and will often find game hidden in undergrowth. Any other questions? Oh, yes. A lot of likes their role as a hunting dog, but do they make a good pet? Yes. Um, when Salukis are not running, they are sleeping. And they will sleep for hours and hours. They will always seek out the most comfortable place wherever they are to sleep in. I've seen them inside a Bedouin tent where dogs of any description are not normally allowed. But the Saluki will find its way in. It will find a very comfortable pile of blankets and it will sleep there. And if you are not careful, it will creep into your bed, uh, certainly onto your sofa. Um, they are very easy to live with, but you ha always have to remember once you are outside, they are hunting hounds and they will go for anything small and furry like a cat or Absolutely, totally safe. No, no problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no trouble at all. Oh. One more. Well, maybe more than one more, but um, um, were there? Um, you showed fascinating depictions of Saluki going back. A very long way in in human history. Were the depictions of other types of dogs still extant? Can you identify other not breeds but types of dogs from? Uh, there are certainly uh, early uh, breeds as early as the Saluki in different parts of the world. In China, for example, mm. and uh, in um, the frozen north. I mean, husky type yeah. hounds are of very early origin. Uh, in Egypt, they bred a, a, a short legged sort of Dax hound type of dog, and they are represented. Um, and of course, uh, guarding dogs have been bred certainly in the Middle East in parallel with the Salukis through very long time. But the fact that these are the only ones depicted really yes. as hunting dogs suggests they were sort of the, the <laughs> successful these breed were, that had emerged. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was a gift to her and uh, she, so she had it as a pet. Uh, yes, um, I did know it. It is recorded, certainly. Uh, uh, it was a short name. That... Hmm. Hmm? No, no, I, I just saw it written that it came as a gift from Turkey. Hmm. No other question. Thank you. I can ask a, ask a question. Um, you mentioned that uh, as a custom, 
um, it was very common to henna stain their feet yes. and tail, where it was prominent, and uh, as a tradition, if it was continued in um, any other region other than uh, Middle East or Mesopotamia, mm. and I wasn't. I, I couldn't quite get the purpose of um, staining their yeah. feet and tail to prevent them from injuries. Yeah. If you could elaborate a little. Yes, certainly. Um, it is applied to the feet as a, you're familiar with henna as a, as a powder and you mix it with water and it becomes a, a paste. Uh, they then apply it to the feet, particularly the underside, the, but also up uh, a little way. They apply the paste to the feet. They bind it around with cloth. And then on top of that, they usually put a, a plastic bag to stop the hound pulling the cloth off. And they tell me they leave it on for 24 hours. I can't believe um, a Saluki would uh, <laughs> keep it on for 24 hours. But the idea is that the henna toughens the skin on the uh, pads of the feet, uh, which prevent, uh, prevents them from damage when they are running. They apply it to other parts, to the tail and the ears. I even saw the hand of Fatima once on the rump of a Saluki for protection, um, for decoration. So it's Okay. Oh, there's one, just one more. <laughs> is there a Saluki club in this country? Mm -hmm. And and what is the approximate population of Salukis? And how long do they live, roughly? There is a Saluki or Gazelle Hound Club. Um, it's not a popular breed. Uh, probably a couple of thousand in the UK. Um, all based on imports from the Middle East. Uh, the first one came in 1895. And particularly um, during and after the First World War, returning soldiers brought them uh, with them and that encouraged the breed. And the club was founded in 1923. Um, how long do they live? Well, in the Middle East, probably not much beyond five, seven years. When they are no longer able to hunt, uh, there's no use for them anymore, sadly. Uh, in the West, uh, 10 to 12 is common, and I've known them live uh, 16 years or more. I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Do I? Oh, I have a number of them. Not at the moment, but I have a, a grey hound. <laughs> a rescue. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Terence Clark. It was a fantastic, entertaining, and very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it very much, and I learned quite a lot. Uh, thank you um, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.